Good morning and welcome to this, uh, the final session of Making Room. And I'll repeat this at the end, but we'll be taking a break until the second week in February, uh, January uh, when Pastor Dawn's uh, new series will start then. Uh, but uh, this is uh, making, I mean, uh, let leave the light on uh, is our session today from the Gospel of John. But let us begin with a word of prayer. You, O oh God, brought light into the world at creation and through a start that points us to Jesus Christ. Send us again that light that scares away all darkness and evil, that we may be instruments of your hope and mercy to others. In the name of Jesus, our light and life, we pray. <clears throat> I want to begin by asking you, have you ever been in a cave where they turn the lights out? Mm -hmm. In Texas, I did. And what did you experience? <laughs> Total darkness. <laughs> Total darkness. You can't see your hand in front mm -hmm. of you. I mean, the darkness is complete because there is no light whatsoever inside there. Mm -hmm. um, I've had that experience too. And, and then um, the area that we were in was a large dome, underground dome in a cave. And um, one of the other people that was with us had gone to the other side uh, of that area. And uh, he lit a uh, sparkler mm -hmm. he had taken in with him. And it's just amazing. I mean, when it's out here, it's not a whole lot of light. Mm -hmm. But in that total darkness, it was a whole lot of light. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though he was some distance away from us, about 100 feet if I remember right, uh, you could see him clearly mm -hmm. uh, with the light that was there. Well, that's the kind of darkness that we're, I think would do us well to think about when we look at this scripture from John. This happens to be my favorite Christmas story, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But here's the story from the Gospel of John from the Common English Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word. And without the word, nothing came into being. What came into being was the word, uh, through the word was life. And the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him, everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of the Father's own Son, full of grace and truth. The uh, setting for this scripture, and we don't often stop to think about that, I think. Uh, w w this scripture will often be read during the season of Advent uh, and Christmas. Um, and sometimes it finds its way into the uh, worship on uh, uh, Epiphany, where we celebrate the light. But we don't really talk about what was the meaning of this light that came into the world? What was the darkness um, that was there in the world? In Isaiah, the 60th chapter, the first two verses, we read uh, the prophet saying, Arise, shine your light 
arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. So, what is the darkness? <coughs> what, what do you think the thick darkness that uh, covers the earth that Isaiah is referring to here? And this would have been, i uh, give you a hint, it would have been appropriate um, for Jesus to have said those same words in his time. Well, there, there are two, two sources uh, of that light, I mean, of that darkness. Um, one being the oppression that the Hebrew people had experienced uh, from time to time down through history from outside uh, nations. Um, at the time of Isaiah writing, uh, they were experiencing the uh, oppression from Babylon Babylonia. Uh, who had uh, conquered the land. Before them, there were the Persians. Uh, and now we're dealing with the Romans uh, who've come in <coughs> and, and have brought oppression. And, and that's part of the dark, that's the darkness that Isaiah is referring to here. But there's another darkness uh, that Jesus would have been talking about or would have been on Jesus' mind uh, and certainly on God's mind. And that's uh, the uh, practice of Judaism. And I say practice because uh, of the leaders uh, of Judaism and the way that they were interpreting the law and the oppressive nature that that brought to the people. Um, it was it was a true truly a darkness. <clears throat> Have you ever experienced a time in your life where uh, you felt that there was a great darkness? Uh, or maybe I should put it in the, the uh, phrase it this way, that there was some kind of a tremendous weight that seemed to be pressing uh, against you. I'll let you think about that. For me, um, it's the reason that this scripture has become one of my favorite scriptures. As I was navigating the uh, bureaucracy um, to be licensed as a pastor in the United Methodist Church, uh, I had to, uh, one of the early steps uh, was to undergo a psychiatric uh, evaluation. And the way this was done at the time that I went through it uh, was a computerized, uh, you know the standardized tests? Uh, even you know about that, don't you, Aaron? St <laughs> Standards of learning, you know about SOLs. them, those SOLs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's that kind of thing, where there were, as I recall, about 400 questions, uh, many of them duplicates, but duplicates in the way that they would ask it in a positive sense one way, and then the next time you encountered it, it'd be in a negative form. So. If you answered it positively one way, then the next answer would be negative, mm -hmm. would be the correct answer. Or, or I shouldn't say correct, uh, but would, a, a disparity would raise a flag there. It was profiling. Profiling, <laughs> yeah, that's it. You got it, Roger. <laughs> we did uh, added management when I was in the supermarket management with Kings. He had a booklet the same way, and everybody was profiled. Yeah. You know, find out if their background and their. their personality would be suitable for being a leader. Yeah. Well, I filled this out around the first part of November. Um, and there was a series of questions uh, in this that ask about your relationship with your father. Um, my father was committed to a mental institution when I was uh, about four years old, somewhere in that four to five year range. Uh, my mother was pregnant with my uh, youngest sister at the time, and, and she's four years uh, younger than me, so it was in that time frame there. And he, he lost all connection with me, and, and as a result, me with him. Uh, his brother, my uncle, would take me to visit him, and he had no concept of who I was. 
um, occasionally they would try to spark a, a response from him and, and tell him that I was my cousin, or my uncle's son. And he was fine with that because he didn't know who I was. And so I never had any relationship with him. It, I can't say that it really um, impacted me other than this uh, psychiatric evaluation. Uh, and I asked the uh, pastor who was uh, administering it what I should do. He said, well, to answer the questions would be dishonest. And uh, he said, I suggest you don't answer them, and I'll send a written explanation along with it. Well, the way this was uh, handled, they, they would take this and run it through a computer, and then the computer generated flags for them to look at, and then a, a psychologist, without ever having met me, would sit down and write an evaluation. Uh, somewhere between the time of running through the computer and him writing the evaluation, that what John Siegel wrote never made it to him. And so he never saw that. And he wrote the evaluation based on the fact that I did not answer those questions. And his conclusions were that I was uh, uh, evasive, uh, dishonest. Um, uh, what were some of the others? Oh, I, I can't figure out how he got to this point, but that I had a problem with uh, women in position, incompetent women in positions of authority. Um, I, I don't know how they made that connection. But the end result was that I felt that with this kind of evaluation that uh, this, this call to ministry that I had struggled so long with wouldn't happen. And this was the time that Glenn Langston was a uh, pastor here. And for reasons that I don't understand, um, the uh, powers that be had told us that we weren't to share this evaluation with anybody, that nobody had a right to see it other than the chair of the district committee on ministry. He, that person was the only other person that would see that other than the psychologist that had written it. Um, I didn't know what to do and I talked to Glenn and he said, well, would you mind if I read it? And I said, not at all. They told me not to, but here it is. And he, he was dumbfounded. Um, and he sat down and he wrote uh, a very polite but very pointed letter to the conference committee on ordained ministry where he called out the uh, psychologist um, and just said that the system was broke and they needed to do something about it. Um, he copied everybody in the world in on that. Um, I was, uh, when I, he gave me a copy of it and I saw the people he copied in, I wasn't sure what, that he did me any favors. But the result was that I did, had a face-to-face uh, a -face, uh, conversation with the psychologist that uh, the conference employed and um, he said, why are you here? And I told him, and he asked me a couple other questions. And then he sat down and spent the rest of the half hour dictating a revised evaluation. Uh, but the thing that got me as I was leaving, he said, you know, most other people would have went ahead and answered those questions and given us the answers that we were looking for. And uh, you know, and I thought, and his, uh, the, the psychologist that had wrote, written the evaluation talked about that I was evasive and dishonest. And to me, to do what he suggested would have been evasive and dishonest. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I took this in early November. The meeting with the psychologist was in early January. Uh, one of the longest trips to Richmond that I've ever made. Um, uh, the, the darkness or the pressure leading up to that uh, was just really oppressive. But during that time, I was uh, regularly going to uh, a congregation in Montvale. Uh, the church has since closed. But as I sat down to try to craft a message for that Sunday, um, after I'd gotten this back, which was the middle of the Advent season is when I got the results back. And 
as I was looking at the Christmas scriptures, and I had looked at uh, what the Gospel of Ma uh, Mark and I mean Matthew and Luke, and I turned over to John because I knew that this was there. Didn't really expect anything to it, but these words spoke to me in a way that they had never spoke to me before, and caused me to see that there was a light. I might not see the focus of what that was going to be, but there was a light in the darkness, and that I had not misunderstood this call to ministry, uh, that it was going to be worked out, and it was. Um, but that's why this scripture has remained so uh, near and dear to my heart, and why I come to it every year at this time, in some shape or form. Is there anything that either one of you want to share? Well, the darkness to me is the unknown part of it. Yeah, I you thought. You don't have enough information to, quote, see the light. But that's like you're talking about the transition period between the time that you received that till you had your reevaluation. That's the unknown part. Yeah. And your mind can go a thousand different directions of what if and if this is going to happen, if that is going to happen. And unless you had some stage, um, people in your life that um, will take up your calls and help push it along and go uh, push down the right path, that's, that was your plus <coughs> right there. And that was your light at the end of the tunnel. Say, mm -hmm. Glenn, that, he helped you see the light at the end and help promote that light being brighter and brighter as you got closer to the reevaluation. He also put himself on the line for me, mm -hmm. um, which I did not expect. And um, as I got more and more into understanding uh, how things work in, in our United Methodist polity, the more I came to understand just what he had d done for me um, and, and that he believed in me. Uh, psychologists might not have, but he believed in me. Well, it took a little extra courage to say something's broke when everybody yeah. else thinking that's the way we have to go and think of how many people before you didn't get that second chance. This, you got the second chance because somebody picked up your calls and pushed you to the limit. Yeah. Well, the system was changed after that. Sure. Because of Glenn's letter, uh, they still do the computerized uh, deal. But before it's given to you, uh, there's now a mandatory face-to-face uh, -face. Face -face interview with a psychologist to uh, talk about those things that the computer has flagged before an evaluation is written. Good. And that. There is a darkness um, over the United Methodist Church right now. Um, We've been, in, we've been discussing human sexuality for over 40 years, debating it and keeping, have kept kicking the can down the road, so to speak, rather than make a decision. Well, we had reached a point where a decision was gonna be made a uh, year and a half ago. And because of COVID, we've not been able to come back together to make that decision. Uh, there is a darkness, as Roger mentioned, of the unknown. Um, whether or not the denomination will be broken up, uh, whether churches will leave the denomination, uh, as some have already done and are trying to do. Um, but there's a darkness of that unknown that, that is there, and I think, as you know, as I look at the candle here in front of me, uh, as Roger was stating earlier, we don't know how this is all going to work out, but we do have the light, the light of Christ, and we know that that light will always be there. The the part of the scripture that that has always resonated with me, and and I always add another phrase. When, when I read this, that's not there in the scripture. And it says, the darkness uh, did not overcome it. I always add another phrase there. The darkness did not and cannot overcome it. 
it not only did not, there is no way that the darkness of, of the world will ever overcome that. I've been doing some reading of a theologian that I had not heard of before, uh, Walter Wink, um, and he's done a lot of writing about uh, um, the, pa the powers and principalities uh, and the effect that they have on the world. And he, um, he takes the spiritual nature out of that. And he doesn't deny that there are evil forces, but he gives them faces that, uh, what, what's the common script says, that um, we, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. Um, well, human, humanity, is where that evil resides, that darkness that resides in the world. Um, but we have the light of Christ that is there uh, for us. Any other comments about the, the darkness? I'm not sure where Pastor Dawn is going with this. Um, I just remember in uh, basic, back in 68, uh, one of the night maneuvers they took us out for training purposes and they had us in a group and had a guy go out about 300 yards away near the tree line, light up a cigarette. At 300 yards, you could see that cigarette glowing in the dark. So they was talking about, you know, when you're out in the field at night, watch what you're doing. You think smoking a cigarette might be okay, but it can be seen for so long a ways, the same way on the sea. You can see that for ever and ever, seems like, because of nothing to, block yeah. off the uh, direction of the light. What all obstacles in life is, is blocking us from Jesus. So you don't see the light sometimes. But if you don't have any obstacles, like in a darkened room or cave, there's nothing to break that light straight to you. So you and have a direct contact with Jesus by no having any obstacles in your and, way. And how do you remove those obstacles? Reading the Bible and studying you, you get up life. close and personal with Christ. There's no so, so that there shortest can, distance between two points is a straight line, and that light is that straight line. And the shorter that distance is, the less, less possibility of obstacles. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I just wanted to say, I, I'm not sure if you were watching this morning, Sherry and Ed, but uh, we got the news about your father, and we are thrilled at that, and uh, we know that you are. And prayers have been answered in his being able to recover this quickly and, and be able to go home after suffering this heart attack. Uh, so enjoy your time away. Uh, we look forward to having you back here when we come back again in January. As I said, we will not have uh, a session to send out over the next uh, three, three weeks, four weeks, I think it is. Uh, but we'll be back together the second Sunday in January. Uh, with Pastor Dawn's new uh, sermon series. Hear these words of prayer as we close out. Creator God, who with the word brought light into the world, send the Holy Spirit as a light to us today. Amen. Thank you all. Glad you're here this morning. Come back anytime.